Inside the dark cave of the Dwarven Mines, Kalis found himself trapped by the collapsing tunnel entrance. In the dark, a small shadowy figure, Tenebra, came to his aid. With her help, he could jump between shadows and made his way deeper into the cave. A single winding path that seemed to stretch forever lay before him, and with that, he ventured further below. After a while, he noticed that the cave walls were repeating, going on forever as long as he walked. Etched into the wall was a cave drawing of a bird, with outstretched wings and the number six carved above his head. He turned back, noting that something was beginning to fill up the tunnel. Whatever it was, Kalis was now knee-deep in it. As he walked, he realized that what he stood in was blood. At the end of the long corridor stood a figure in complete darkness, only visible at the very edge of Kalis' dark vision. It was humanoid, but as Kalis got closer, two large bat-like wings extended from its sides, silhouetted in darkness. Hello? Kalis called out. No response. He began to walk forward, but as he moved, the figure seemed to stay at the same distance, despite still standing totally still. Who's there? Kalis asked. The figure was silent for a second, then slowly turned its head. There was something inhuman about its form. I had hoped you would be human, it said. Who's there? Kalis asked. I had hoped you would be human, it repeated, giving no other response. The pool of blood began to rise, and the room started to spin. Kalis found himself suddenly in a wide open field. Before him lay a small village, and behind was an army. He made his way into the village. It was home mainly to kobolds and a few women. The army charged, and all around him, Kalis watched the innocent people being slaughtered, helpless to stop it. A young wyvern emerged from the town's small bard college and fled the battle. Kalis followed him out into the fields. The young wyvern looked back to see his mother and girlfriend cut down by human soldiers. He collapsed to his knees, but was soon dragged away by an older figure. The sky grew dark and clouded around him, and massive buildings sprouted up from the ground. Kalis now stood face to face with his traveling companions, Anya the angelic cleric, Sylvan the charming rogue, Darnier the racist dwarf, and Eren the Venara blood rager. Kalis watched as their forms slowly shifted, contorting into monsters. Anya sprouted rotting wings and grew dark feathers. Sylvan collapsed to all fours, patches of dark orange fur turning him into a monstrous fox. Darnier grew to the size and physique of a bear. Eren's muscles expanded, and he took a more feral form. Kalis' friends attacked with a torrent of claws, talons, and teeth. He leapt into the air to avoid it with his airwalk ability and fled to an alleyway. Kalis stopped to catch his breath and take in what he had seen. Two tall, distorted figures confronted him with glowing white eyes. One taller and one shorter. They spoke in unison. An ominous and incoherent message met Kalis' ears, and the last words resonated through his mind like an echo. Kill the king. Kalis suddenly shot up, waking from the terrible nightmare to find himself still safely situated in his party's campsite. Hello and welcome to Dungeons and Dragons. This episode follows the continuing adventures of the party established in the Arsene Alonso video, so if you haven't seen that one, check the link in the description before continuing. Having dealt with the Arslan problem, the party was sent on a wild goose chase in search of a powerful and ancient oracle that could help them get into the central city of Italis. Their search took them first to the swamps of the south, where they encountered and apprehended Tarika, the shadow conjurer that had previously attempted to ambush them. Leo took her back to Italis to stand trial. On the way back north, they also ran across one of the necromantic beast monsters, which Anya recognized as Gabriella, the knoll who they'd failed to protect previously on their journey. Whatever had happened to her, it was clear that these monsters were not coming from nowhere. They were people somehow turned into the vicious beasts. Anya put her down once again out of mercy, and moved on, having gained one more clue towards the origin of this plague. A few days into their journey towards the dwarven mines of Inmia, the party found themselves in a field of rolling hills. Cresting one as it began to grow dark, they encountered a small campsite, 
and approached it in curiosity. There, they met a feathered friend clad in eastern armor, with a glaive at his side and a bow on his back, as well as a large traveling pack. Hello, I am Tangu, he introduced himself. The party had never seen anyone like him before. What are you? asked Darnier. Tangu gave him a weird look. I am Tangu. Tangu also introduced his traveling partner, Gorin, another unique individual. His skin was bark and his hair leaves. Gorin doesn't talk. He's the strong silent type. Tangu informed him. Where are you headed? To my glorious homeland, the dwarven mines of Imnia, answered Darnier, though he wasn't a fan of the two strange travelers. We were also heading north. Would you like to join us? No, said Darnier. I don't see why not, said Kalis. Why are you heading north anyways? We heard rumors of a gathering of beasts and thought we might check it out. Beasts? Why are they gathering? Don't know. That's why we're going to find out. The party moved quickly north, evading monsters as night fell and eventually found themselves at the entrance to the dwarven city of Inmia, below which lie the mines and the information they sought. No visitors allowed, the guard told them. Let me handle this. Darnier stepped forwards. Can I vouch for these fellows? Most of them, anyway. Sorry. We can't be just letting anyone in. But, maybe there's something you can do for us. Then we'll let you inside. There's a force of beasts gathering in the mountains to the east. We just want to know what they're doing and if they're a threat. Find that out, and we'll let you in. So Sylvan, Anya, Darnir, Kalis, and Eren waited until the night had ended and headed to the east. The climate was icy cold and windy, but the sky was clear. The party stood atop a large snow-covered hill, looking down at a series of tents of varying sizes. There was some deliberation on how to approach, and Aaron and Zan started a snowball fight. While no one was paying attention, Sylvan simply walked away and strided straight into the camp. As he approached, there was a ripple through the air, and then a loud noise. Sylvan had set off an alarm spell, and the entire camp was now aware of him. Kobolds with spears began rushing out of the tents, surrounding him entirely, shouting things at him in their native tongue. Kalis and Anya noticed this, and tried to stealthily head down the hill. Kalis became invisible, while Anya stayed low to let her pale white skin and armor hide her amongst the snow. The chaos began to calm as a booming voice called across the crowd of kobolds. Hold. The crowd parted to allow a larger figure through. A reptilian man stepped by something between kobold and dragon, a wyvern. He wore heavy armor and carried a mace. The expression on his face showed disinterest, as if his will had been worn down from countless years of waiting. I apologize for my people. They do not recognize your kind as I do. I am Kathan, and I am the leader of this army. Seeing that the situation had turned diplomatic, Kalis dropped his invisibility and stepped forward through the barrier. Kaffin seemed unfazed as he had noticed the footprints appearing in the snow. Anya and the others joined as well. If you've come to fight, we can settle this right here, Kaffin said. But otherwise, let us step into my tent. Once out of the cold, the party began to ask Kaffin questions. What are you doing here? What are your goals? Are you going to attack India? Let me tell you a story, he said, gesturing to the seats. He pressed a button on the handle of his mace, and it fell open to reveal that the insides of it were a lute. He began to strum and sing. Oh, many years ago we were heroes, but then one day they came. The human armies marching and drove us all away. They burned down our villages set fire to our homes no place on earth was safe again we hid among the stones oh but then came a hero named magnus the prophesied warriors rise he slayed the evil king and his dragon and claimed his royal prize He took a deep breath. My father taught me that song. The first part of it is true. The second half is more like a prophecy, but my father was no oracle. Call it wishful thinking. 
Who is this Magnus? Some say he is a spellcaster so mighty they had to take away his voice to stop him. Others call him a warrior so powerful he felled an entire army on his own. But the truth is, he is only a legend. A story that gives our people hope. <laughs> Maybe the name's a placeholder. Kayla suggested. For whatever hero rises up to help you. Exactly so, Catherine said. I believe in some ancient language the name means great. So your only target is the human king? Darnier asked. What about the people? It's not my intention to harm them, but I will kill the old king, no matter the cost. Satisfied with the answers they'd received, the party decided to return to Inmia. Kalis wished Caffin luck on his quest, and Caffin returned the sentiment, stating that he was welcome to return if he had more questions. Once they had shared the information they were given, the dwarf allowed them entry into the city, where they could finally rest and begin their real mission. In the meantime, Darnier saw fit to search for some gold in the mines. He struck up a deal with the guards to let him keep any gold he found in return for a percentage of it. With his keen dwarven nose for gold, he managed to make off with quite the sum, telling the guards he would have to have the ore smelted down to give it back to them. He made another deal with the blacksmith, and then absconded with the gold, keeping it all to himself. The next day, the party gathered and made their way into the caves below the mines. The entrance looked eerily familiar to Kalis and put him on edge, but nevertheless, they pushed forward. The area below the mines was a maze of traps and danger, and the further down they got, the more it seemed someone wanted to keep them out. They eventually found themselves at a set of three doors, unsure of how to proceed. They decided to split the party between the doors. Kalis and Eren solved a simple puzzle involving torches. Darnier ran down a hallway as it filled up with water, trying not to drown. And Sylvan and Anya found themselves at a large chasm. As they tried to carefully slide along the narrow pathway at the wall, they noticed the large humanoid winged beast perched on a pedestal at the center of the seemingly bottomless pit. It hadn't yet seen them, and so they tried to move quietly. Anya kicked a small stone off the ledge. They both stopped, hoping it wouldn't make a loud noise. Several seconds of silence, and then a loud thud echoed through the cavern. The monster turned to face them, but Sylvan had made Anya invisible with an ability no one knew he had. Silently, they waited until the creature turned its attention away. Then Sylvan formed an ice bridge, and they quickly ran across to the door at the other end of the room. The party reconvened on the other side, sharing their stories of what they saw and why Anya was invisible. Kalis seemed frightened at the mention of the winged beast. I think I saw that thing in a dream, he said. Let's get the hell away from this place as fast as we can. They continued down a hall until the cave opened up into a huge space with little makeshift huts. They had reached their destination, a Sferf Nebelin village where the oracle they sought resided. The answers they needed were so very close. Asking around, the party learned that the Sferf Nebelin village had been established to protect a massive door that was said to be the boundary between life and death. They were also pointed in the direction of the hut where the mysterious oracle stayed. The oracle told them that they would find the fiend responsible for the beasts standing in the throne room, at the center of Italis. And if they wanted to get into the central city, they must find the guard captain, Stoic the Great. Now the final leg of their journey could begin. Using an old elevator that had been shut off by the Sferf Neblins for centuries, the party ascended back to the Dwarven Mines, where they were greeted by four guards and the blacksmith that Darnier had robbed. Give us the money you owe us! See? The thing is... I already spent it, Darnier explained. Then we'll have to teach you a lesson. By this point, the party had had enough with Darnier's antics, and decided to stay out of this one. He attempted to flee, but was cornered and beaten down to near death. Sylvan was able to convince the attackers to take only his gold rather than his life, and they eventually backed down. Sylvan helped the beaten and bloodied Darnier off the floor, and revealed that he had pickpocketed the muggers when they had their backs turned. But hopefully, Darnier had learned his lesson, and wouldn't be starting any more problems. Thanks for watching this episode of Dungeons and Dragons. 
If you enjoyed it, leave a like and subscribe for more. Feel free to comment your own D&D stories down below. And come follow my Twitter, at Dungeons and Draw, where I give updates, interact with fans, and even let you vote on what story I tell next.